the Islanders say goodbye to Clark Gillies. Uh, he lost a, uh, can I say it's a battle with cancer now? They announced that? Yeah, his yeah. daughter His daughter put on Twitter like a heartfelt message tribute to him, and she mentioned, she didn't get into specifics, but she said it was a brief, aggressive bout with cancer. Yeah, and uh, I have a friend of mine, I have several friends of mine that work over at UBS Arena, but I have a friend of mine that just saw him two weeks ago and said he was in good spirits uh, right to the end. And he was a fighter. That's what he did. That's what he did. And uh, an amazing, amazing player. Uh, Clark Gillies, uh, among uh, all of his accomplishments, of course, winning four Stanley Cups, but he also created the Clark Gillies Foundation, which is a non-for-profit corpora- corporation that assists physically in development. Development are financially challenged uh, children. Uh, current and former Islanders honor Gillies. Uh, Matt Martin said, I think he epitomized everything that a New York Islander is. Brian Trottier said, I played some left field and second base. Clark, he played third base and caught. It really wasn't fair. He was built like the Marlboro Man, V-shaped, scary, and what a ball player. And I love this. The only time that they ever fought, uh, according to Trottier, was when Gilly said when Trottier would fight. He, he would yell at him and say, number one, you're an ugly fighter. And number two, if you hurt your hands, you're out for eight weeks and I miss my bonuses. <laughs> and Saturday night, before taking a question, I know he should not be named, but uh, former captain John DeVera said he was tremendous to me in my time here and obviously made a hell of an impact on and off the ice. And of course, uh, I think this is a great line that says it all. Um Rangers coach Gerard Gallant, as a kid growing up, I wanted to be Clark Gillies. So, Anthony, you're the one that put up quite the memorable uh, memorial to him on your Facebook page. Go on. Yeah, um, it was it was a gut punch, to say the least, fellas. Um, you know, when anyone loses their life, it's really sad. Uh, but, you know, when it's a legend on your favorite team, you guys went through a Roger Bear, um, you know, it, it's, it's tough. And... I think what makes it a lot harder in this case is Clark Gillies was 67 years old. He's a young man, guys. Um, and, you know, I was at the home opener for Belmont. He was there. You would have never thought there was anything wrong with him. He looked he looked healthy. He looked vibrant. Um, it's, it's just, uh, you know, and listen, it's his personal preference. Obviously, he wanted to keep his battle with cancer private. Um, no problems with that. But I think that's why everyone was, was so shocked about it. Um, you know, we all know that Mike Bossy's battling lung cancer. The team announced that, in the, I think it was in the summertime. But again, there was no inkling that Clark Gillies was sick. So um, the news broke right after the Islander game. Uh, I forget who they were playing already, but they won the game. And Shannon Hogan broke it on the post game. And I walked away from my TV a little bit. And like you could tell she was fighting back tears. And the camera was up on the banners. And at first, it didn't click. I didn't think there was any possible way he could just die like that. So originally, I thought maybe. He was breaking that his wife passed or something like that. Um, and then as she got talking more, I realized it was Clark himself. And, um, yeah, it was a it was a terrible, terrible feeling. Um, you know, I met him outside the Barclays Center in that picture I posted, and it was before the first round against Florida in 2016. Um, you know, he was greeting fans, uh, you know, talking to everybody. And what you heard everybody say about him, he was a really nice guy, Um Big, big, big player in the community with this foundation. And, you know, obviously all his accomplishments on the ice. He really pioneered that power forward position. Um, he, he was, you know, Phil, by the way, thank you for doing that wonderful tribute on your show. I had a hockey game that night, so I couldn't do that. But um, you did that well done um, for a range fan. I remember Clark Gillies like that and all his accomplishments was nice. Um, you know, but... He, he was a guy that <laughs> he would score 35 goals and then he'd kick the shit out of you if he had to. Um, and what's most yeah. impressive about it is he never, he never amassed more than, I think, 96 penalty minutes in a season. Never went over 100. Um, this goes to show the type of game that he played. Uh, so, yeah, he, he's, he's going he's gonna to be missed um, by a lot of people. Um, he touched a lot of people. And um, hopefully, you know, the Islanders can at least – you know, finish their season strong here and, you know, do it for Clark for here on out. But yeah, it, it, um, it was difficult news for, for the whole fan base and hockey world for sure. We'll get into the, the current Islanders in a moment, but Phil, your thoughts on Clark Gillies. 
I don't know how much I can really say that I didn't say the other night when, when I did it. I, I mean, he was one of the driving forces on that team, uh, on those all, all those dynasty teams. I mean, from the 70s into the, into the 80s, up until when Edmonton finally dethroned them, I mean, they were – the, the, he might have been the heart and soul of that team. If you want to argue Dennis Potvin, sure, I, I, I'd listen to that. If you want to argue Mike Bossy because of how tremendous of a scorer he was, I'd, I'd listen to that too. But, I, I mean, I, I guarantee you that if you really put a gun to all the guys on those teams' heads, they'd probably tell you that Clark Gillies was probably the heart and soul of that team. Um, he was a guy who went out, and, and a lot of Ranger fans, you probably remember Ed Hospitar, Boxcar. Yeah. Clark Gillies absolutely destroyed him in a fight. And it was one of the most one-sided ass whippings I think we've seen in NHL history. So that just goes to show you how tough of a, of a man that Clark Gillies was. And, and uh, Brian Trotche's quote about him being built like the Marvel man was, <laughs> was pretty much on point with what he said there. But um, <laughs> from what I've heard from Anthony, I've, I've heard many times from Anthony how, how nice of a guy Clark Gillies is. I've heard from my uncles. The stories that they would tell about him and just, you know what? And, and another funny little bit is, is that Clark Gillies once finished top 10 in Selkie voting, finished sixth overall in Selkie voting while scoring 91 points and 30 goals in a season. Like that just goes to show you how good of a player he actually was. And if he was relied upon more offensively, uh, I think that his numbers probably would have been better throughout his career if he, he, he was more of, in more of a little more of an offensive role. Because he could absolutely score. So, uh, Clark Gillies, legend, like I said, feared and revered by all. So, rest in peace. Well, one thing I got to remark about, and we were talking about this before we went to air, is that Clark Gillies was in the generation of players that they would engage with the fans so often, and they would play a game and then go across the street to the bar and just have drinks, yeah. and usually the fans were there. So, yeah. that's that's one thing that kind of isn't as there as much anymore when the, the professional athlete really uh, started booming in their salaries. I do have to say, Anthony, um, as I usually kick my camera like an idiot, um, you just said something that's so surprising to me. And it's surprising also because uh, Butch Goring had one of the more surprising statistics that the guy could be one of the best defensive centers of all time. And, um, he never amassed or he had he had i think five seasons with eight penalty minutes or fewer clark gillies never amassed more than 96 penalty minutes in a season yeah wow there are not yeah. often where statistics blow my mind that's one of them because you're talking about a guy that played during the dave schultz era <laughs> where uh the flyers were ready to just throw down with anybody clearly um to, to borrow a line from Chris Nyland, uh, there were no takers when it came to Gillies. <laughs> he might have offered fights, and they were just like, nope, nope. And well, nah. yeah, I mean, the only the only comparable I could think of in terms of like Gillies, in terms of how that that worked, was probably George Larocque. And George Larocque's like the second half of his career because no one wanted to fight him. But Clark Gillies was ten times more skilled than George Larocque. Was yeah. actually good in his own zone defensively. And he was a big leader on those teams. So I, he's one of the most complete players I think the game has really ever seen. I was trying to think of a comparable to a today player for him, but anybody I thought about would not be a uh, compliment to Clark Gillies. So, uh, no. So we're just going to go on from that. Uh, but – the the current Islanders are playing and they are over 500 for the first time since November. They're seven two and one in their last ten. They sit in sixth place, and I don't have to put any quotes next to it, Anthony. Right now they're in sixth place, and I think they're only uh, two points out of fifth uh, to jump over Columbus. One that point. is correct. Yeah. One point. That's why I had to yeah. double check that. With they have several <laughs> games in hand, goal differential is getting closer to zero. And Matt Barzell is leading the way, and four four more points in his last four games. Are the Islanders back? Well, one one before just that one la one thing I, I didn't get to say before we finished on Gillies. I don't know if any of you guys know this, but he signed with the Houston Astros in 1972 and played minor league baseball before he uh, played hockey. 
Um, just goes to show what type of athlete he was. I had no idea he played baseball. Right. This is wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, yep. no. Um, actually, that is something. Unfortunately, I cut it from the quote from Brian Trottier. That he said he was a great athlete. He could play every single sport. Football, baseball, basketball, hockey, golf. Um, <laughs> he was just a pure athlete. Yeah. But unfortunately, I, I did not know about the Houston Astros thing. I know Brian Leach pitched in college. Or no, high school, he had an 87 he did, mile yeah, and basketball. Like, uh, we all know about Tom Glavin. Tom Glavin, and he was yeah, drafted Tom before Luke Robitaille and Brett Hall. So. Right. I mean, um, there's a lot of guys that they're they're multi sport athletes when it when it comes to uh you you don't hear about the hockey player as much because the hockey player ends up just going playing hockey and then they don't talk about it. But Tom Glavin, yeah, yeah he's he's one of them. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Anthony, are the Islanders back? Well, I'll put it this way: if if you know they're they're ten four and one in the last fifteen games, if you know if this was the start to the year right now, they'd be they'd be at the you know top of the division like like many people predicted. Um, so they they're getting there for sure. My my fear is that they might, when it's all said and done, because of their start, um, it might be too much to overcome. But you know we'll we'll see. If, listen, if they keep playing like this and win their games in hand, you never know. But yeah, right now I'm encouraged with they've seen. Yeah, they played some bad teams and they've won. But you know they say you're supposed to beat the bad team, so uh, credit to them. But uh, Matt Barzell's playing a lot better. Um, you know he's he's the points he's been accumulating. Um, you know he's kind of. Obviously, he's not at point per game, but he's getting to that area where if he stays hot, you know, he could end up amassing, you know, around 70 points or so. So that would be good for the team. Um, but he's playing well. Uh, you know, Brock Nelson scored his 13th goal. So, you know, he's starting to pick up his game after, you know, missing that time with the injury. Um, you know, Zach Frise, who I talked about, I loved his work ethic and how hard he skates and how hard he really makes it on the opposition on the forecheck. You know, he's he's finally starting to be rewarded with some points, which is nice to see. Um, you know, overall, I would say their team defense has been a lot better, uh, was being led by Noah Dobson right now. Um, and then, you know, the goaltending, Varlamo, has been a little better, with, with the exception of, you know, last night, Ilya Sorokin's been tremendous. Um, so, yeah, they, they're, they're rolling right now. Um, they got a couple more games at home here that they've got to finish strong with. And listen, they, at this point... They're essentially playing house money. I mean, all they could do is worry about themselves, take it a, a game by game, uh, try to get two points, and, you know, go from there. If they look up at the standings and, you know, really see the task at hand, that could be a little deflating. So they just got to take it one game at a time. Um, and, you know, listen, hope that maybe Boston slips a little bit because I think realistically that's the only team they could catch. Um but those games in hand are huge. You know, they're, they're 14 points behind Boston. I think they have four games in hand, five games in hand. So you're talking eight to ten points, um, which if they capitalize, that would help a lot. So uh, definitely night and day from earlier in the season. I just wish they could have started like this. Otherwise, you know, we're talking about a different script right now. But unfortunately, we're not. But, um, yeah, I'm encouraged with what I see. And like I said, you know, whatever happens, happens. But um, one game at a time. Felk. Uh, you know what? Anthony made a good point about beating the bad teams. You got to beat the bad teams. Uh, they were down 2 nothing against Philly. And then right after they scored, the se- uh, Philly scored their second goal last night. The Islanders came right back and, and tied the game with two pretty quick goals. Um, so, that you know, that's what you have to do if you're the Islanders. Uh, you have to start beating these teams. You have to make sure you get your points. Um, maybe they uh, – maybe they make a run and they get close to the playoffs. Like Anthony said, it might be too little too late. It might be too much to overcome. But, I mean, even if they don't make it, it's a good sign for an Islander fan. You know, you want to see this team come back and play strong. You know, would, would, a, would a high pick help in this year's draft? Yeah, sure, sure. You, you Obviously, you want the chance that someone like Shane Wright. Shane Wright would absolutely be a difference maker for the Islanders going forward. But at the same time, the Islanders, this is kind of a weird season for them. So you, you don't exactly want them to be finishing at the bottom of the barrel because that's not what you want this team to be. You know, you don't, you don't want that mentality heading into next season, you know. So for a team that had Stanley Cup aspirations, it's probably best that they finish the season strong, whether they make the playoffs or not. Just go out there and worry about their own games. Wor- don't worry about the scoreboard watching. Worry about your own games. Worry about playing your games. Worry about getting your points. Worry about playing to the best of your ability and then focus on next season if you don't make the playoffs. Because I, I think that with the right acquisitions, 
and the right touches, they could probably be a playoff contender next year. Um, whether they're a conference finalist or better next year, I mean, uh, that obviously remains to be seen. And we're, we're a while away from that. But at least if you end this season well, you go into next year on a high note. And that's really what you want to do, especially if you're Barry Trotz. And especially if you had this disaster of a season where you had your high hopes and then you take your step back and then you, you go you go forward. This uh, It's easy for fans to say this of, oh, just tank and get Shane right and we'll worry about this uh, later. That, that's that's not the way you want it to work. You want the organization to know that you're committed to winning and that's what matters the most is winning because then you end up being the Arizona Coyotes and perpetually rebuilding all the time. That's not going to work. And the New York Islanders... If they go on a run, and it looks like it looks like they're putting it all together, guys, it, it really does. But I'm not sure if the schedule is going to cooperate with them on that. I've I've been vocal about those two West Coast trips coming up. But if they end up going on and making a run and missing the playoffs by one point, you're going to get a lot of those players coming back, chomping at the bit, and then can't wait to go do better next year. And that's, that's what you, you want this organization to be that hungry again. And th- th- that'll happen. And then it's another year. Then you could also develop some of the other players you got right now, more on that when we get to the bar talk segment and get them ready for next year and another playoff push. And maybe even make a free agent signing or two with a salary cap room that they got next year. Anthony uh, finish this off for us. Uh, I, I think um, you know you guys a lot of, said a lot of a lot of good things there. Um, I think Ryan Pollock coming back is going to be big. Um, they try to get back to the Pollock Pellick pair, which which should help them. Um, Pollock eats a lot of minutes for him for them, so that will be nice to have him back in the lineup. Um, so that is certainly a good thing. Um, and it's just about more. I think more continuity. I think I think Trot, like for instance, Trotz the other night he scratched. Oliver Wallstrom because he, he didn't like a pass he made uh, in the game against Arizona. He's too um, hard on him. And then yeah, he he is too hard on him. He sat him. He was back in the lineup last night. But I think this is a guy. He's a young player. You know, he's he's an offensive player. It's not going to be natural for him to be a defensive wizard and the smartest player right away. I think by by sending these messages to him. Um, I don't really don't think it does anything. Um, I think he needs to play every every single night. When, the dilemma I had with Quinn. The when, same dilemma I had with Quinn. And, and to make to make it worse, the guy the guy is the best like he has the best shot on the team. He's an asset. So when you take him out of the lineup, you're only hurting himself. So um, if they could just you know like I said, get some continuity in there. You know let keep, let Wallstrom keep building the confidence uh, and they keep playing the way they're playing. Um, you know let's see what happens. Put all the chips on the table. And wherever they fall, they fall. But. Um, you know, I, I think, though, if they can continue this play, um, I want to say, and I could be wrong because no one really knows Lou and what he thinks or what he does, but I think if they can get to at least, like, five points or so or six points maybe tops or less out of a playoff spot by the deadline, I think he actually still might make an addition um, if they're that close. Anything more than that I don't think it would make sense, but if they keep playing well, and they chisel down this deficit they have to around, you know, like I just said, five or six points. I think Lou Lamorello may look to add to, you know, really try to help them because the mandate from the owners, they just spend all this money in arenas, win now. Um, and they're not going to give up on this season unless something totally goes really, really bad from here on out. So um, we'll see what happens, but they're heading in the right direction. Well, it's good because nobody seems to be giving up on the season right now from ownership right down to the stick boy. So what do you guys think? Uh, what are your memories of Clark Gillies? And uh, are the Islanders back? Are they really for real? The way they're playing right now, not so much that they're going to be going to make the playoffs. It's just, are they back to where they, to being a good team? I'm going to say yes. If you like that video, we got a lot more. So check out any of these that are right over here. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Your ideas are intriguing to me, and I wish to subscribe to your newsletter.